very expert colleague and um, friend here in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm at. And, um, and, and we work together on a lot of clients. So I think some of what we're going to have to say today should be interesting. <laughs> um, as, as much as Ryan just said, today we're kind of down to the basics um, on this part one series of powers of attorney, financial powers of attorney, and health directives. And I know later we'll get into more of the, the nitty gritty on wills and trusts and other aspects of estate planning. But um, Ryan's got a screen that he's he's about to share with everybody um, to get started on our our uh, topic today. So um, there, um, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yep. yep. If you want to go to the, the first slide um, uh, on powers of attorney. I will tell you, I've been drafting wills and trusts and everything for uh, over 20 years now. And I don't know that there's a document that's come in more handy in the crux of the moment, um, you know, when things are happening than the power of attorney. So so we're going to dig into, into that and health directives today. But I always love to start my estate planning talks with number one, because it's something people put off. Nobody wants to think about dying. I don't, but but I advise clients to plan as if they're getting hit by a bus later that day. <laughs> um, you know, so and I always start with what percentage of us are going to die? A hundred. So whether you plan now or plan at the last minute, it needs to be done. Um, it needs to be done not for you, but for the people that you love. Um, you know, to, to make their lives easier, to not pay lawyers, believe it or not, I have enough work to do. So, so when clients plan properly and things go smoothly, it's, it is just a win-win for everybody. Um, a lot of times, just really quick through, through this slide, clients and people think, well, I'm not a bazillionaire, so I don't need to plan. Entirely not true. Even, Clients with, with very few assets absolutely need to plan again because otherwise to, to pass away without a will and a power of attorney and all the things that we'll talk about in this series makes it more expensive and um, just much more of a hassle. So the essential documents that you see down there at the bottom, mm -hmm. the will, the power of attorney, health directives, today we're focused on the financial power of attorney and the health directives. And um, in the next part of our series, we'll get to the other documents. If you can go to the next slide, Ryan. Um, so the financial power, this, I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard of it, but you know, people walk around and they say, well, my power of attorney did this and, and I've named my, my granddaughter, Jenny, or my friend, friend Bob. It is a very powerful document. Um, it is the document that you give to another person to basically do anything that you could do in your own name. So it, it's always fun for me when I'm sitting with a husband and a wife even, and I say, you're giving them a power of attorney, they can literally walk you know, into a closing and sign for you and sell the house. So you, it, you want it to be a total position of trust with that person that you're naming. Um, unfortunately, and Melanie will probably touch on this, it, it's the document that gets abused. Um, you know, it's the one where grandson comes in and, and robs grandpa. <laughs> Having said that, banks have gotten more financially savvy. So the, I would say that the worst thing that I see is when someone is trying to come up with a power of attorney too late um, in life. So they're either already ill, there's a question of whether they're even competent to sign and give someone the power of attorney. Um, if you don't think the lawyer is going to question it, the bank definitely will. If they, I would say that if they smell a rat, they're not going to honor it. So that last bullet point that I have there, um, I can tell many stories, but but there was one where um, a gal had probably a few weeks to live. The, the POA was in question. The bank had never heard of this granddaughter who was trying to, you know, to help and move assets and, and get things titled so that there would be no probate. Um, they had to send it to the legal department. The legal department took two weeks and um, the woman had passed away in the meantime. So it, it wasn't useful because it hadn't been done early enough. So with these, you know, 
They are specific state to state somewhat. Ohio, for example, where we are, will honor a power of attorney from another state, but it just takes it even longer. So if you've moved recently or um, are in a, in a state other than Ohio, you want to have a state specific financial power of attorney because um, banks like to like to see those. But but basically they come in handy when um, you're incompetent, you know, they can come in handy when you're when you're competent. So I have one, my sister, for example. So if I were, I would be out of the country for some reason, she could act in my regard to to do all of those things. Um, usually they're used after dementia has set in or some kind of incompetence and you need that person that you totally trust to step in um, and do things. I will mention in these because back in the day, it was very common to have what's called a springing power of attorney where you say, well, I, I would like Bob to be my, my power of attorney, but, but if he can't, then I would like Jenny. And so before a bank is going to honor that and allow Jenny to act, they're going to make her prove that Bob couldn't do the job. And so that just adds time. Normally when a POA is needed, it's needed quickly and immediately. So I always tell clients, if you trust two people enough that you would actually allow them to act in that role, just go ahead and give each of them a POA. Um, usually it comes into play with children. And so clients will say, well, my daughter's great at this in case she couldn't, then my son. So sometimes we'll keep the second one hidden, you know, at the law firm and the second child doesn't even know that they have the POA, but in the event it's needed, we can dig it out of the coffers. Um, if you can flip one more, um, they come in handy for, for many reasons. One of the ones I want to mention here, because it'll tie into our next two series is avoiding probate. Um, if you haven't been through it with a family member, you're lucky. You know, whether it's a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, um, whatever state it's in, it's never, never pretty. I'm selling my my law partners who do probate um, out of work, but but it's expensive. Uh, you just pay the lawyers and there's really no way to avoid doing that unless you get assets out of probate. And in the next two series, we're going to get more into that. But. Uh, powers of attorney come in very handy late in life so that if um, a parent, for example, has become ill, I can advise that son or daughter who's handling their their affairs to, trans, you know, get the house made transfer on death or get the checking account payable on death to, to whomever, um, but just to avoid probate. And there are many reasons to do that. I won't go into all of them right now, but it's a public affair, you know, the, the courts involved, appraisers, if there are any businesses owned, it's um, somewhat of a nightmare and it's the last thing that a grieving family wants to have to deal with, but, but very easy to avoid if you plan early and effectively. Um, next slide. So, and, and we'll get into this, but I wanted to add the slide today. Just, um, you know, a lot of times it seems overwhelming to clients, they say, well, I have a checking account and a savings account and um, a condo. And it's it's very easy to title those things properly, either with a transfer on death designation or a beneficiary form or a transfer or a trust. And we'll get into trusts um, in uh, a month or so at our next session. So if you want, so healthcare directives, this is gonna be more Melanie's wheelhouse than mine, but it is a legal form. The, the, in Ohio, at least the Bar Association works with the Ohio State um, Medical Association to put out the new form. Ohio's, I believe, came out, latest form came out about four years ago. And the two documents, the two main ones are the living will and the healthcare power of attorney. The living will, and these are never fun to talk about, but that is basically a directive to the persons that you name. So it doesn't really give them powers, but it names them in a document with your wishes on whether you would want to be kept alive, um, you know, how long, what, what the parameters would be. 
Um, it's better than a DNR. I know a lot of people say, well, I, I already, I have a tag on my hand that says, um, do not resuscitate, but a living will is a more legal document that you can have on file um, with your doctor anymore. If a 20 year old goes in for a hip surgery, they're going to ask, ask um, him or her whether they have a living will. Um, so it does name persons, but, but um, doesn't really give them a ton of, of power. It just really, I like to think of this document as one that gives peace of mind to the people that are named that in the event you're in a, you know, vegetative state and two independent doctors is what um, it would take to declare that, that these are what your wishes would be. Um, there are sections within it where you can get specific. Ohio's right now has a lot of um, uh, information you could fill out on organ donation. So it's still enough to check the box on your driver's license if you want to be an organ donor, but you can get pretty specific. And I've seen it all, as I'm sure Melanie has, you know, on certain clients that are okay with one organ and not another um, or one purpose. So I always point that out because the boxes now, if, if you just check you know, I can be an organ donor for any reason at any time. Potentially, you could, your body could be used in a medical school, for example. So it's important to pay attention to those provisions and these documents. I'm the healthcare power of attorney, which goes along with a living will. It's twice the length. And the reason is, you know, that it gives the, the persons that you're naming actual powers to act in your stead, whether you're it's end of life or whether you're just um, unconscious or incompetent and can't make healthcare decisions. So it actually gives those persons um, powers to make those decisions for you. Um, I point out there's one newer provision in both of those in, in the past few years. It was based on the Terry Schiavo case out of Florida where the family argued for close to a decade. Um, the, lack of a better way to say it, the plug had been pulled, so to speak, but but um, Terry Schiavo ended up living because of still being given nutrition and hydration, even while in a vegetative state. And the family fought over whether to withdraw that. So the forms now have provisions where you can specify what you would want in that regard. Um, there are some ancillary forms like the donor registry form. Um, if, you know, everyone is different on if, if you're very intent on being an organ donor, it's helpful to fill that out. Um, I'm sure Melanie can attest, I, in my experience, it, it really comes down to when, the, when that time comes and the family is there. Uh, but having these forms in place to let them know what you would want is, is a good idea. Um, next slide, should be close to finished here. To, to pass off stories to Melanie, hers are more interesting <laughs> in that on that front. But um, after she's done, we're gonna we'd be happy to take questions and and throughout. So okay, you can. I hope can everybody see me because I can still see you, Meredith. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, like Ryan introduced me. Um, my background is the medical background, so I'm not anything with the legal, but I work with attorneys on a regular basis because one of the things that I do do with my clients is to make sure they have their estate planning documents in order, particularly um, power of attorney documents. But um, I'm a board certified patient advocate. I'm a senior certified advisor and I'm an aging life care professional. So Ryan, next slide. Um, you can next slide of that one too. Okay, so what is an aging life care professional? So I know Kendall at home, we sort of overlap with some things that, that I do, but today I really want to talk about, again, um, estate planning documents, healthcare directives, um, things of that nature. So I'm pretty much, my team and I, I have a registered nurse on staff and I have a, um, um, I think my phone is ringing. I'm sorry. So an age, um, a, a social worker on staff and then a registered nurse. And then I'm, um, have a physical therapy background, but I've done a lot of different things in my career 
Um, so I will do handle the financial end as well. So we're looking at all of our um, clients in a holistic manner. So the medical, um, the financial, the psychosocial and the environment, um, because most of the clients that I work with also want to stay in their home. So we'll do the next slide and it just, it's pretty much the same thing I just said. So we'll do go to the next slide again. Um, so again, I, Kendall is, um, I'm very familiar with your organization and I know that you're out of Kennett Square, uh, your corporate office. Meredith, did you know that um, Kennett Square is the mushroom capital of the world? No? Well, if you ever oh. go, it's a wonderful little town, so you should go to the their Kennett Square Pennsylvania. So I, I realize that you guys have um, communities and in several different states. I'm gonna speak on Ohio specific, because like Meredith said, these some of these are very state specific. Um, she talked about, you know, the healthcare power of attorney and the durable power of attorney. Um, and I know she mentioned a little bit about the living will. We are, because we're in the medical aspect and not the legal aspect, I, every time I get a new client, I am talking to their loved one, whoever that may be about the DNR, a do not resuscitate. In Ohio, there is a DNR comfort care and then um, arrest and then a DNR comfort care. So two different things you can choose, but that is something that every client that I have, we're, we're um, reviewing that document. And, and if people are at home, and you call 911, say they have home care, you call 911, the medics are not gonna look for a living will. They're gonna look for a DNR. So if you have a DNR, great, we put it on the refrigerator. If you don't, then they're gonna treat you like you have you know, no documents. Um, I review these with the client um, themselves, if they're competent, with the family members and with the guardians. I work with a lot of attorneys that are guardians and I actually act as a guardian myself. If you get in with attorneys that are acting as guardian, we, I just took a case two weeks ago and um, I asked him if there was a DNR in place and he said, no. And I said, is that something you wanna address? And he said, no. Well, um, I, I would prefer to address it, but that again, he's the guardian so he can make up uh, the decision. Another health care health directive form is um, the MOLST or the POLST, which again, Ohio, this is Ohio specific. They don't really um, view that as they didn't adopt that form, but in other states they do. So if you want to look up that, what your state specific is, um, you might have a physician ordered for life-sustaining treatment or a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. Um, and it just gets more into detail about what your wishes are um, and that you talk to a physician about that or healthcare providers. So I would um, encourage that as well. So next slide, Ryan. So what makes us a little bit different in our scope of practice is that I personally, it's not my team members, um, but I personally will serve um, as the agent for a healthcare or a durable power of attorney. Um, and I'm in Columbus, but I've been asked to serve for someone in the Cleveland area, um, in which I do. I am her uh, financial power of attorney, if anything becomes happens to her. And um, she lives in a very nice retirement community. Um, she was, it is very well off and she did not trust her family to deal with her finances if she was unable to do so. So um, I am very picky and choosy about the um, clients that I will take on. I, I have served in a couple roles where my clients have been exploited um, and I'm going to get you, I'm going to talk about a couple of examples, of course, because it, it's what I see out there is um, disheartening. Um, I also serve as guardian of the person. Um, in Ohio, there is a guardian of the estate too. I do not, I do not serve in that role. Um, I refer it to an attorney that specifically does guardian of the estate work. And I have served as trustee in the past. So I, and, and I've had my 
my own power of attorney documents done since I was 25. I'm 45 now. So, um, and I encourage my friends to get them completed. They're not that expensive, but people don't understand when you don't have these in place, things can be, um, they can get very ugly sometimes as well. So I, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And if anybody has questions, just uh, raise your hand or Ryan, you can stop me, whomever. So um, I have, I'm a guardian of a person that has three children. One happened to pass um, last year, but it was the daughters that fought over the mother's healthcare decisions, where she would live, who would do what um, for three years, three years in court, $90,000 of attorney fees. And by the way, the daughters didn't pay for those attorney fees, mom did. Mom had um, a power of attorney document completed then she had a dementia diagnosis. Then she had another power of attorney document completed naming the other daughter. So three years in court, um, they mediated on a third party being her guardian and that is me. Now, I cannot imagine if my mother had a third party making her healthcare decisions. However, in this instance, I am. Um, so what I work with attorneys and I would, I would say the same thing to you. If you ever get into a situation where you're referring someone to complete their power of attorney documents, but you're unsure of, um, the competency, I know that your nurses, you have nurses on staff and they can do, um, you know, a mocha a mini mental. I prefer to have, I encourage people to have a third party do it. And we are considered that third party um, where my registered nurse can do a MOCA. Um, I prefer the, the MOCA over the other, the testing, the cognitive testing. Then, then we can, and we do it in the same day. So we will come in, we'll do a MOCA. If they pass, we, my nurse is there to um, have the document um, that says that she completed it. And then the attorney can do the power of attorney. Um, sign the document. So if it ever goes to court, and you think it never will, but believe me, I, the things that I've seen, um, again, sometimes are heartbreaking. That way, there is proof that the attorney did their due diligence uh, of the making sure that person was um, competent individual. So that's one of my examples. Um, another example for the healthcare power of attorney is I had a client, which I still have her. Um, she just turned 93 last week. Um, and I started working with her about three years ago. So she had a biological son and then she had a stepson who she preferred the stepson to help her make decisions. However, she did not have any power of attorney documents completed. So one time she had to go to the hospital. Um, her next of kin is her biological son. Um, the biological son wanted to put her in an assisted living facility. She did not want to go to the assisted living facility, but really the, um, the stepson really had no, um, he had no authority to make decision making. So she ended up coming home against the against the son's wishes, the biological son's wishes. So when we, when I got her home, I was like, you know, Joan, you, you know, if you became incompetent at that point, your son as the next of kin could have put you in a facility. And she said, that's not what I want. So I explained to her the importance of these power of attorney documents. And it goes over better when I'm talking to our clients because First, they're not naming me in 99.9% .9 of the time. And secondly, I'm not an attorney saying, I need you to do these documents and then give me you know, $750 or something. So there is, I have no skin in the game. I, have, I am a total independent third party. Um, the, the stepson who is a high level executive with a large company at West said, Melanie, it'll never happen. I said, well, all right. I said, Chuck, but let me try. He's like, fine. Well, guess what? 
she signed the documents, she updated her will, she named her um, healthcare and financial power of attorney to her stepson, who that is who she wanted. And um, he said, you know, again, we've been trying this for 20 years, never got it done. And uh, we were able to get it accomplished again, just by me being a third party, trying to explain to um, my client how important it was. And if she couldn't make decisions, the decision would have been made that she didn't, what she didn't want. So again, I believe in respecting wishes of my clients. Um, and this is one way that that can happen. Um, I'll tell you about an example of exploitation um, for a financial power of attorney. Actually, it's both healthcare and financial power of attorney. Client, um, I got a referral from a social worker from an independent home care agency who was seeing um, a client in an Alzheimer's facility. And we're at a networking event and she starts to talk to me and she said, I don't, this guy's an Alzheimer's community, but he's totally competent. And I don't know how to get around this because the son is making the decisions. So um, I was like, okay. So I asked a little bit more of a background about this individual and he did have a brain bleed. So he fell, he had a brain bleed. Um, the son decided to put him in a locked Alzheimer's facility. Um, he recovered. He was, he read the paper from front to back. He knew about things that I didn't know about, specifically about, you know, the election and um, we were talking. So I was like, okay. So I said, let's get a psychologist to come in to do an expert evaluation. And again, very state specific on expert evaluations. Um, so I'm specifically talking about Ohio for guardianships. So I had an ex, I had a psychologist do come in and do an expert evaluation. He totally passed. Um, the next day I had an attorney come in to name me as power of attorney. Um, all I was going to do was get him out of there, help him getting his things in order, and then he could revoke the power of attorney. And we talked about this. I said, this is temporary. We just got to get your sort of your um, life back um, and for you to make your own decisions. And he, he was like, absolutely. So he signed it. Um, I actually, <laughs> um, when I went in, the, the administrator tried to tell me that he was not competent. Um, I showed him the documents. Um, I said, you know, it doesn't matter. These are legal documents. They were completed and that I had every intention of moving him out of an Alzheimer's, a locked Alzheimer's facility, in which I did. I then found out that the sons were trying to get guardianship, but neither of them could back pass the background check to complete the guardianship paperwork. And they had a different attorney that was working with them. So um, then, I, then I start to dig in his, you know, um, going through checks and, and the last um, two years that he didn't have anything over his life. He didn't have any um, say in his life. And the son who was the financial part of the attorney hired himself, hired his wife and hired his brother to do all kinds of work um, for, for on behalf of the father to help clean out the house um, the house was literally falling down, but yet um, they were doing all this work. Now I could have had that house cleared out for a couple thousand dollars. They paid themselves about $18,000. So then it got into um, with the bank fraud, you know, of course the fraud department is here and asking questions. So, um, you know, the, the sons, they, you know, they didn't have any money, but um, I was like, you, this was, you know, undue influence. Um, and so I, I needed him, them to pay back some money. Now we didn't get all of it because that would have been going to court. So we, um, negotiated and was able to get $7,000 paid back client. Very happy. I moved him into an assisted living facility. That was $2,000 a month less than he was paying, um, and then I told him to revoke my power of attorney that I was sort of done. 
and I helped him set up auto payments and everything. And he said, no, he says, I think I'm going to keep you. So here I am. I'm still his healthcare and durable power of attorney, but I don't do anything for him. But in the case that something happens to him that he is incompetent, I will be there to step in um, and handle whatever he needs. So um, it's 12.33. I could go on about another case or two if you guys are interested in hearing it. Ryan, why don't you give me some feedback? Yeah, so I, I think um, one question that I have in, in, hear, in hearing these things, it sounds like there were a lot of um, terrible situations that happened to people. Uh, what what do you recommend that would have prevented these situations from happening? Is it all in planning? Is it in selecting the right people to be powers of attorney? Meredith, if you want to chime in on this too, if you have ideas on that. Um, yes, I I'd love to. I, I think the key is acting early. And when any, you know, even I would say that to a 20 year old. Um, because nobody ever thinks that this is going to happen to them, you know, that they're going to be in this position, but it's, it's morbid to say, but my job is to have people plan as if, again, something's going to happen today. And so planning early, and um, I, I would say what stalls people a lot of times is that they say, well, I don't know right now, um, this daughter's being nice and this one's not, and they're arguing and, and X, Y, Z. And so I don't know what to do. And I say, well, pick one because all of this is so easily changeable. So you want to just plan and have something as your absolute backup. And um, if, you, if you change your mind in a week, two weeks, it's very easily changeable. It takes, it takes me five minutes to do. Um, so it's not the $750. <laughs> um, it's, you know, so it's very, but, but you want to have something in place, but, but what you touched on too, Ryan, it, it is critical that you have someone that you trust. And so a lot of times the child that you would want to be your caregiver and make the healthcare decisions is not necessarily the child that you want looking over your Merrill Lynch um, investment account if something happens. And so it doesn't have to be one person. Um, it can be different children in different roles. And it's important to have a backup, you know, to, to those roles. So if one of them, um, you know, in, in the healthcare power, usually I would say in a healthcare power, I'm not um, in the medical profession, but I think when uh, when you name the persons in those, that they all typically get called and hopefully come in and make a good joint family decision. But these are kind of the just in case documents that if there is some kind of battle and it does come down to it, which of those kiddos or friends do you want making the final call? And I would just add that pick someone and have that discussion on for the healthcare side. Can they, can, do they have the ability to respect your wishes, which is really, really important. And that's why if you have that living will done um, in a DNR, it helps them not have to make the decisions, but just be there to say, yes, I serve in this role. Um, and yes, I'm the power of attorney, but Specifically, if you wanted to put a provision in saying, you know, don't keep me on life-sustaining um, life -sustaining measures, you already made that wish. Because in, in, during COVID, let's face it, it you know, did you want to go on a ventilator? Um, I actually had a, a friend that was 52 years old and she died of COVID. She went on a ventilator and she didn't think she would get off and she did not. Um, so those are the things, this is again, why it's so important just to, to plan and pick the right person. And that right person doesn't have to be a family member. And in some cases it shouldn't be a family member. Absolutely. And, and so for any of our viewers to feel free to type in questions in the Q and A or the chat box and, and we'll, we'll answer them. Um, but a quick thing, in my mind too, what are some common mistakes that you, you both see 
in these fields, things that should be avoided. Um, and it could just be lack of planning and, and preparation or not doing it soon enough. But what are, what are those common mistakes that you see that, that some of our viewers should try and avoid? I would say in, in a financial power of attorney, um, not doing it soon enough. You know, so often it's not until mom or friend is sick that they call me and they say, oh, my mom's really sick. Um, we need a financial POA so that I can handle everything. And I'll, I always insist, even though a lot of times the kids will try to get me to just draft it. Um, I always insist on meeting the actual client who's filling it out and where the, where their dementia is questionable, then I can't, um, you know, legally I can't prepare that. So acting early while you're confident and thinking in terms of what happens if I'm not confident. Um, you know, I would say that that's the most common thing. Other times I've seen people try to, they'll come up, they say, well, I have a POA, I got it on legal Zoom. You know, it's um, a page and a half long, I found it online. And there, it's not only does it not meet Ohio's statutory requirements, but it's not expansive enough. So the, you know, banks will, they will pick on things. And so, for example, I had the one that I mentioned earlier that um, the woman had become ill and the bank, I won't name, name banks, but I definitely know which ones are tougher than others. They sent it to their legal department and three weeks later, they still hadn't acted on it. She passed away, ended up having a probate estate of, you know, which costs attorney fees. And, and I don't even do that, but attorney fees in a probate estate are many, many tens of thousands of dollars that would have totally been avoided if the bank had honored the power of attorney, but they wouldn't because it wasn't in line with standard Ohio law. It wasn't expansive enough. You know, it, it said, well, um, I, my agent can get into my bank account, but it didn't say, they can transfer stock or they can put things into a trust and that sort of thing, sort of thing. So I'd say on, on the financial side, being careful, um, you know, about what it says, who drafted it, making sure it meets muster and doing it early. So there was a question about the difference between a comfort care arrest and a comfort care DNR. So um, I have pulled up the actual DNR form for Ohio. And, and I can send it also to Ryan um, if you would like, but I'm gonna read you the definition because I think that would be more helpful. So the DNR comfort care arrest, providers will treat patients as in any other without a DNR until the point of cardiac or respiratory arrest at which point all interventions will cease and the DNR comfort code protocol will be implemented. And the DNR comfort care, again, you, you, it's on the Ohio document, uh, but providers will um, perform basic medical care, clear airway, airway of an obstruction or suction, if necessary for comfort and or to relieve distress, they ad may administrator, administer oxygen, CPAP or BiPAP, um, may obtain IV access for hydration or pain medication. What they won't do is they won't perform CPR. Um, they will not do um, they will not do cardiac resuscitation. Um, they won't defibrillate. Um, they won't insert an airway. So they're not going to um, insert an airway. What I'm losing the word that I was looking for. Um, so I would, and again, this is, this is a document that has to be filled out by your physician. This is a medical document. This is not a legal one, um, but the DNR, the DNR form, I can send it to Ryan, but it is for, again, for Ohio. So, so Melanie, it sounds like uh, DNR comfort care rest is, is more of like a traditional DNR, except 
uh, in the case, it will only be used in the case of um, cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest, whereas comfort care is more of, um, they're not gonna perform life-saving measures on you, but they're just gonna perform those uh, little ancillary um, things on the side to, to just make sure that you're comfortable in dying because no, no one wants to have these uh, massive pain uh, things. It's more of like a hospice situation. That's yes. Kind of what it kind of sounds like. I think you described it better than I did, Ryan. But I, so I think Mountie nailed it too in that it is a medical document. So um, everyone's different. Everyone's going to want, some people are going to want to choose the uh, comfort care rest, some comfort care, some, some aren't going to want to do a DNR at all. Um, so I, I think that those questions are best to be had with, with family members and also with your medical uh, doctor as well uh, to kind of go over what might be best for you uh, and then fill out those forms accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, but then quick question, Melanie, too, because the most was, was asked too. What in, in practice, um, what what how is the most used in practice? So um, we don't use it here in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So it is not recognized, but in other states, and I would have to do a little bit more due diligence, but the, the most or the post. Um, have you ever heard of the five wishes, the five wishes document? Mm -hmm. um, so it goes into, so it, again, these aren't, these are documents that can, they're not necessarily legal documents, but they are, can really go into detail about what your wishes are very much more specific than, um, than a living will. Mm -hmm. So if that, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. again, I can show you, I can send you a link to some some state specific because I know you're in several states, Pennsylvania, New York, um, Virginia, things of that nature. So again, this is all state specific. And yeah, so I always recommend I always recommend that when um, you know, if if a client gets very specific and I've seen everything, so they'll say, I want my ashes taken to the west side of the mountain north of Seattle, yes. go left and blow it. <laughs> them into the wind and so I so I recommend that form to, to just you know show family members but when when someone is when when a client is very adamant about a certain thing I had a client who wanted to be what's called plastinated and turned into a wax figure <laughs> so we won't go into that but they were so intent on it and they thought that the family would that that you can insert that into legal documentation so that the hope is that the family honors the wish, but if they don't and they fight, that documentation is there that, um, you know, of the intent of, of the deceased. And so that there, there's another question too, as we keep mentioning the term state specific here, um, do, does, if you get one in Ohio, like a DNR for instance, Will that carry over to wherever you are? Say you're on vacationing in Florida and all of a sudden you pass in Florida. Um, would that carry over? How, how do you recommend people go about that? So that is an excellent question. Um, I, I think that they should respect the state specific DNR, the state DNR where, where you had it. So if you had to do, but, Again, are you going to be carrying that document with you? I mean, so if you have a DNR, you would want to give it to your doctor. You would want to have it on file. So if you're going to Florida and if you have an accident, you know, the first thing for medical people is do no harm. So they're not going to, unless it's in their system or unless you have it on you. Um, and I mean, they're pocket cards too for, for those, if you wanna, you wanna have a pocket card, but they're not gonna go through and, and look specifically for a DNR. So, I mean, if that is your wish, um, I would definitely have a wallet card. It doesn't matter what state that you're in, but if you do like, um, if you live half of the time, like in Florida or Arizona and half the time, you know, Pennsylvania, Virginia, New York, I would have um, whoever you deal with, say a hospital system, I would have that done for that state that you're in. So both states, I would have it done. And I would have a wallet card right behind your driver's license. Because if you're going to be in an accident, 
they're going to look there, but they're not going to look anywhere else. They're not going to search through your wallet. Right. Yeah, I would say, or I think states end up honoring other states' documents, whether it's a will or a healthcare directive or a financial power of attorney, they honor them eventually. But um, the key is that when these sorts of documents are needed, they're typically needed like right away. And so, you know, the, the more on the ball you can be and be state specific on, on these, the better. Sounds good. Perfect. So um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through in the chat or, or the Q&A. So uh, Meredith and Melanie, thank you so much for your time and, and this presentation on it. So again, this is a part of a three-part series here. Um, so Meredith will be back with us uh, in, a, in about a month uh, on May 27th. That's a Thursday uh, at noon. And you can uh, register for that by going uh to the events page at the Kendo at Home website, uh, just like you registered for this one here, uh, and uh, go through it that way. Um, but uh, Meredith, do you want to give a quick teaser on, on, on what it is you're talking about next month? Um, I think it's not because we have two more. I, I believe next month is the, the basic estate planning. Um, uh, I think it was. I think it was the the avoiding probate benefits of a trust. Um, yeah. So um, the basic wills and trusts, and um, I I always love scare tactics. So like I, I started out with one. Um, you don't want to pass away without a will. You also don't want to pass away with a probate estate. Um, it's it's just lawyers. It's confusing. It's not what grieving spouses, children, or family members want to do. And it's so easily avoid avoidable. Like I said earlier, I sell um, I sell out the lawyers on this, but I hate probate. I, I don't know that anyone likes it. And it's, you know, whether when, when I'm finished planning with a client, if they have a few assets and they say, I've got a condo, a checking account, and that's it, we can title it properly. But if there's really anything more than that than just a simple trust um, saves the day. So a lot of times when you say the word trust, people, their, their eyes glaze over and they think they're being, it takes no, a lawyer no longer to draft than it does a will. And it keeps them out of probate, which saves them money. So that's what we're going to talk about next month. Look, looking forward to it. So um... Thank you so much uh, for, for joining us today. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you guys next month. Okay. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Bye.